<clears throat> Hello again. So we are continuing our series in 1 Timothy. Uh, we are in chapter 4, going verse by verse. Today is 1 Timothy 4, 12 through 16. I have uh, titled this sermon accordingly uh, with all of the imperatives in this section. I thought it would be appropriate. Practice. Progress. Immerse. Persist. Persevere. This is the title of today's sermon. Now, please stand with me for the reading of God's holy and authoritative Word as we sit at His feet to learn and grow and obey Him. Please stand with me for the reading of 1 Timothy 4, 12-16. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift you have which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things, immerse yourself in them, so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. You may be seated. <clears throat> Lord, please bless the reading and preaching of this, your word to our hearts. Let it be a faithful exposition, and let us be faithful listeners and disciples, learners. Good, passionate, hungry students. Be glorified today and always. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, are you indeed practicing the faith diligently? The word that Paul uses here could also be thought of as meditating, but in context, I think it's rightly translated practice. Are you progressing visibly? Now, of course, Paul is speaking to Timothy, a leader who's been called to and ordained for a particular role. But remember, we've said that deacons and elders and everyone in ministry, if they're faithful, they're called to be models, to be examples, to be followed. To whatever extent they follow Jesus faithfully, to whatever extent they follow Paul faithfully who was following Jesus, they are to be emulated. And so when we read this, where Paul is speaking to Timothy, a leader who's been ordained to do this role, we don't think, well, that's Timothy who's a leader. We should think, Timothy is an example. And the pastor, our elders are examples. Even our deacons, they're examples. And so this applies to me, is how you should hear this. And you should be asking yourself the same things. You should apply them to yourself without the particularities of an elder. So you should be saying, am I meditating on and practicing the faith diligently? <clears throat> am I progressing? Am I seeking to grow, to advance, to progress faithfully, visibly, such that someone else could objectively evaluate it and see it according to Scripture? Of course, progression in this sense comes internally first. But always, you cannot separate the two. If you are progressing in the faith, someone will see it. It will be demonstrable. We don't measure our success by the outward, but, but we can see it, right? We can see it. Our success is in growing and sincerely relying on, knowing, loving, adoring our God. But then we will have fruits. So we will progress visibly. And we do this by immersing ourselves in the Word of God, the things of the faith, and persisting in them. And this is how we persevere unto salvation. This is how we persevere unto salvation. So come with me to verse 12. Verse 12, Paul says to Timothy, let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. All very important. All very important. 
So is youth a problem? <clears throat> We've said before, it's quite obvious that God intends there's some value in experience, being older, having life experience. That's why they're called elders who God has appointed to lead His church. But is this idea of an elder, people called to lead the church, is this exclusively uh, a matter of age? I would say no. I think that it is important. It's ideal to have people who have life experience in the role of elder. However, this is more of a case of having spiritual experience. We're told in Scripture, both with deacons and elders, we don't want people who are new believers, who are youthful in the faith in the sense that they, they haven't had time to mature, to really have the gospel work in them, to transform them. They haven't experienced uh, the things that they need to experience to be able to counsel others, to, to even understand what the Word is, is saying to them and to others. Timothy's probably at this point, since he met Paul on his second missionary journey, that is Paul's second missionary journey, um, and this is a few years later, uh, we would think Timothy could be like in his late 20s to mid-30s. In some churches, like when I arrived here, that would be extremely young. And I would say actually right now in the state the church is in around the country, late 20s to mid-30s is stunningly young. <laughs> Unfortunately, the church around the country, there's, there's very, very, very many churches that are on the verge of dying out. They only have folks who've been there for four decades, five decades, three decades. Um, so you could easily see here where Paul had appointed elders, and this was some time ago, and Timothy's in a situation where he's having to dis discipline elders that it would be quite natural for people to feel uncomfortable with Timothy telling them what they should do. However, the authority of an elder is always where? Where does the authority in the church locate ultimately? We talked about this in Sunday school. It's fortuitous. In the Scripture, right. So the church has authority, but it is delegated from Christ, from God. And the church is commanded to delegate Christ's authority to officials who are ordained right, through ceremony. So the elders of the church, they lead with a true authority, and they're to be submitted to and followed, but their authority is not theirs. It is Jesus' authority. It's the authority of Scripture that they wield. Of course, there are judgments, but ultimately the, everything is evaluated by Scripture. So Timothy, regardless of his age, the authority locates in the Word, and Timothy has been called and commanded, and Paul specifically is telling him, exercise this authority for the good of the church, for the glory of God in Christ. Remember, Jesus didn't start His public ministry until He was how old? About 30, right. He was crucified around 33. So, if we were to despise people merely based on age, no one could tolerate Jesus. Every church in America would be offended by Jesus telling them what to do. <laughs> So it's not merely about age. Unbelievers here, you see, so there's this, this problem. You see that Paul's encouraging Timothy and he's, he's telling them it's actually an imperative. Don't let them despise you for your youth. And there's a distinction here. He says, make an example for believers. So immediately in this verse, we have two categories. We have believers and unbelievers. Unbelievers by implication. So how should we think about these groups relative to what Paul is saying to Timothy? Know this, unbelievers, and you better believe it. I was just talking to a pastor the other day who said to me, sheep bite. You better believe there are unbelievers in churches. Hopefully very few. If it's the healthier a church is, the fewer unbelievers. I'm not talking about people coming to visit. We would love to load the seats with people who are seeking. I'm talking about members of the church. There are members who are not born again in churches. And there are also people who are born again sometimes who are very immature. We're all on a process of maturing. Some are more mature than others. Some are very immature. People who 
are not believers, of course, are going to behave differently than immature believers. Immature believers, sometimes you could think, wow, you know, like, are you a believer? <laughs> but they're just immature, and they need to grow. So unbelievers and immature believers can be very shallow. They, they have shallow, shallow reasons for coming. You know, they might come to church uh, for all the wrong reasons. They come because the, the, just be, mainly or just because of the music, right? Or they like the way the building is. What an awesome building. Or uh, they, they mainly come for the children's programs. All legitimate things to like or care about, but not the decisive things for mature, sincere believers. Along that same line, people come to church for all kinds of wrong reasons. People also have very superficial and wrong reasons uh, or shallow reasons for criticizing and resisting authority, especially in our consumeristic, individualist culture. And so people, you could easily see people despising Timothy for his age. And I want to I encourage you, if you're thinking about the age of the person rather than the content of what they're teaching and evaluating whether they line up with the faithful teaching of Scripture, you're thinking and acting immaturely. Age matters. It's not irrelevant. But we should not be distracted. We should be evaluating based on the Word of God. We're after the Word and the authority locates in the Word. We're not thinking about the clothing as the main center of attention that the person wears. Does it matter? Sure. But that's not the center of our attention. We're not thinking about every little mannerism. You know, I touch my nose too much when I preach. If that's all you take away from the sermon, you need to grow. You need to grow. You need to repent. If you're thinking too much about things, I'm just giving you an example. There are a million examples, right? There's right things and wrong things to put at the center of your attention. And now people should, especially in leadership positions, do everything they possibly can to take away distractions so that you can learn well. However, there's responsibility from the teacher and there's responsibility from the student in the teaching transaction and process. Sincere, mature believers don't get too hung up on superficial things. If age is not uh, diminishing the quality of the biblical teaching, then we don't sit there fixated on how old Timothy is. And, and also, if we're mature, we're humble, we're gracious, we're not proud. We could be taught by anybody. If you're a faithful, mature Christian, you could go work anywhere. I'm not saying it would be easy, that there's no adjustment period, but you could go take orders from that snot-nosed new MBA who's never known a darn thing about the business world. You could go and you could sit under them and you could follow their direction in a way that magnifies Christ without being miserable or being passive aggressive or acting like a jerk or being insubordinate and, and either subtly or explicitly resisting their authority. We magnify God in through and above everything that we do. And so we must be, if we're sincere believers and we're maturing believers, we're gracious and humble and we can take instruction. We can sit under authority. No one should think they're qualified to lead if they're not capable of following. If you can't glorify God in the way you follow, don't dare aspire to lead anyone. We must be humble and gracious and rightly focused on what matters. Right? Sinners focus on the wrong things. Sinners hate authority. And sinners especially hate God's authority in His Word. Because the essence of sin is to love something other than the God and to rival His throne to want to take His authority. The sinner wants to be God. I had a former member of the church say, um, you know, I didn't listen to my two husbands and I'm not going to listen to this 47-year-old man. Do we, is that credible Christianity to think and talk and behave that way. That's a real example. I'm not naming names, but that actually, that's just mild, actually. I've seen and heard things like that innumerable. Innumerable times have I seen things like that. So, Timothy is told by Paul here 
This is an important distinction. Set an example for believers. If they're unbelievers, forget about it. They hate God, they hate his authority, and nothing you do will make a difference. For believers, if you are faithful and you are visibly progressing in the faith, it should help them, it should encourage them, it should instill confidence, and it should aid them in thinking rightly about who you are and your role in the church and how to love you, how to serve you, how to work with you, how to, how to be a, a, a support rather than a detriment in the ministry of the church. How do you keep someone from despising you? This is an imperative, it's a command. Don't let them despise you. What do you do? You slap them around, maybe? How do you stop someone from despising? Maybe you give them a lobotomy. They won't despise you. They, they won't be able to eat their cereal with a spoon. You'll, <laughs> they won't do anything. <laughs> you can't stop someone from despising you. But if they are a believer, it presupposes that they have God the Spirit living in them and that they want to grow in loving God and obeying God. They want to grow in magnifying Him in the way they do life, the way they do church, the way they interact with various authorities. And so they will actually be responsive to a good example. They'll be encouraged by it. He's told to do this, to set this example for believers. This word despise here is a very strong word. It's not a mild word. And this is exactly what people do who don't love God. Matthew 6, Jesus talks about you cannot serve two masters. Does anybody remember what happens when you try to serve two ultimate masters? Right When you're at work, if you, let's go back a tick. If you're at work and you're serving the snot-nosed, clueless 28-year-old MBA, who has way less experience and no clue, and you're having to glorify God there, who's your master? Is it the 28-year-old? Maybe it's the executive over him? Is it the CEO? It's the board of the corporation. Your master in every context is the Lord Jesus Christ. One and only with no rivals. It's never the 28-year-old clueless MBA fresh out of college who's trying to prove that he knows stuff so he will not shut up at the meeting while you're trying to explain how things work. <laughs> Jesus is always the master, and it's very clear from Jesus' own mouth, authoritatively, in his word, in Matthew 6, if you try to serve two masters, you will inevitably and invariably Love the one and get along well with the other. Everybody awake? You will love the one and you will hate. You will despise the other. You cannot be duplicitous. You have to be wholehearted in, in recognizing authority and you're always serving the Lord. In every context, you are under the authority of Christ through His Word and He delegates it to His church, to the officers of the church, and you're always on the same one bottom ultimate mission to magnify his name in everything. We're always under his authority. So Timothy's told the way that you deal with believers who are maturing, we're in a process, we're not perfect, we're sinners, we're growing, and we need assurances, we need help to get the distractions out of the way. The way to build confidence and help them not to uh, despise or be distracted by your youthfulness, Timothy, it's, it's to have your teaching control your life. Have your teaching actually impact visibly demonstrably, measurably, your life, Timothy. And this goes for you. It's not just for Timothy who's been called to be a leader. He's Remember, he's a model for all of us as Christians. So Paul could be saying this to you. In any and every situation, maybe you're the snot-nosed 28-year-old this time who's fresh out of college trying to prove himself or herself. In every situation, you must be committed to set the example of Christ to demonstrate Christ that this teaching actually translates into your living, your doing, 
You're feeling, you're thinking, you're doing. You're feeling, you're thinking, you're doing, right? Or you're thinking, you're feeling, you're doing. You're inside to your outside. Always. Always. So what does he say to him? This, this word, for example, here, it's where we get the word type, tupos. Um, we use it too for like types, like the prophetic types or patterns in Scripture. But in this case, just the straight up word, it's like an example. Uh, 1 Peter 5.3 says, set an example for the flock. It's a parallel verse. Set an example for believers. Unbelievers won't be responsive, but believers will see it. And what is the word underneath? Where, where does this word come from for, for set an example or a type? It actually is very interesting. It's the word for striking something to leave an impression. Like a stamp. Striking something to make an impression. Do you know that your life, which must be transformed and uh, dictated by the Word and, and the way it works in your heart, your life is striking everything that you come into contact with and leaving a mark, making an impression in the church, in your family, in your job, in your marriage, in your neighborhood, in the world. Your Life, your actions that come from your worldview and, and your inner life, it's making an impact. It's striking a surface and leaving a mark. It goes further though. This word is not just meant to mean uh, striking a surface to make a mark, this type or example. It's actually the idea, the full sense of it is that it's to create a mold so that you could use it to duplicate the thing, right? The example is like a mold. You, you, you make an impression on a surface picture, like you pour some wax or, or metal or, or something that you can melt and that will harden into there to create a duplicate. Well, that's exactly what Timothy wants. That's exactly what Paul wants in Timothy's life. And that's exactly what you should want as you follow Timothy, following Paul, following Jesus, who is God. You want your actions, whether, they, whether you know it or not, or you admit it or not, they leave a mark on everything around you, but you want them to leave a mark that's the shape of Christ and duplicates Christ. You want to reduplicate Christ in your wife, in your husband, in your son, in your children, in your boss, in your neighbor, in us. You want this to be the all-consuming passion of your life, to know Him and love Him and see Him magnified in the way you are producing His holiness through knowing Him. His grace is changing you and your actions driven by gratitude and joy and grace, thanksgiving, are changing the things around you for better. There's no guarantee of any outcomes. You could be as faithful as you want and you might be sentenced to death. And if you're surrounded by unbelievers, and that might even happen in a church, you will get your teeth kicked in, as I like to say, no matter how loving or faithful you are. So what are these things that God is calling Timothy to do to set this example, to make a mark, right? To have an impact on the believers in the church. He says, so notice, your speech, so it's, it's holistic, it's everything. The way you talk should be governed by the truth in this word. Are you immersing yourself in, in talking the way Christ talks, or the way Paul talks, the way God wants you to talk? Or is that some other part of your life? Your speech is a separate area. You've compartmentalized it. You're like Bill Clinton. You can compartmentalize 300 different areas. You could be all kinds of things at one time that have nothing to do with each other or contradict each other violently. Sorry, Democrats. I just thought of him. I thought of him defining is when he was when he was being impeached. He was like, well, it depends on what do you mean by is. What is is? <laughs> I promise you, when people talk like that, that's not a good thing. That's not a good thing. So we're called here speech and then conduct. What's the word here for conduct? Right? Your manner of living. So the way you talk, the things you choose to do, the way you do everything is worship. Whether you're um, you know, the janitor in, in the building, you're the architect who built the building, 
You're the director of the programs that are run in the building. You are the president of the country where the building is. You're the tax collector. Whoever you are, everything that you do and everything that you say, you are engaged in either worshiping God or the creation. And so we should be concerned with setting the example and having an impact to reduplicate Christ in the way we speak and the way we act. And Timothy, in your faith, set the example. Right? Create a mold that's shaped like Christ with your faith. Faith starts on the inside, right? So if Timothy or, or Chance or, or Danielle or any of us, if we trust God, right? If we actually trust God, it's because we're getting to know Him. We know what He's like. We know what He wants. We know who He is. We know the kind of things He does. We know what His goal is. His ultimate goal. So we trust Him. The more we know Him, the more we trust Him. And the more faith translates into faithfulness. Faith always, true faith, always will translate into observable faithfulness. Right? Conduct. Speech. Outward external action. And then purity. Pure, that P-U-R that comes from uh, you know, fire. Purity, the idea of melting away in things that don't belong there, that aren't natural, right? Making something a, a single substance. Purity, Timothy, be pure, be completely devoted in the things that you think, say, and do. You're not three different persons with three different agendas. You're not even two different persons, depending upon what party you're at or what environment you're in, or who's listening. When you're alone, you're the same Timothy as you are when everybody's here. When you're at church, you're the same Timothy or John or Sarah or Debbie that you are when you're out at the park with your dog. The same Timothy at the beach. The same Timothy driving on the road, getting cut off by people from New Jersey who have no idea how to drive. A little self-deprecating humor goes a long way. They're angry about your youth. Make fun of New Jersey. That could help. Just kidding. So, verse 13, moving along. Until I come, Paul says, right? Read with me verse 13. Until I come, devote yourself to the... So this is a strong word, devote, right? Like, you don't come and go... You're all in. You do this. This is where you're at. You're, you're anchored down on this. Until I come. Paul expects to come. He doesn't say it in a, like a, condi a way that's got like a mood to it of maybe I will, maybe I won't. Paul expects he's going to come, but he's saying, until I come, and this is always true, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching, to teaching. These are elements that could be in a liturgy. What do I mean by liturgy? Like the elements of a worship service like we're having. And they're definitely spoken of here in the Greek like they're known things, like they're, they are elements of the life of the church, whether it's in the worship liturgy or other practices that they have. Because there's an, a definite article, right? So it's, it's the, in each case, each one of them, the public reading, the exhortation, the teaching. Like, you know, those things that we do as the church, they're, they are um, essential to what we are and who we, who we are and what we do. We, and, and what's the common denominator? The Word is at the center of the Christian's life. It's at the center of the leader's life. And he's modeling for the church, for you, this is at the center of your life. Our life. Christ's life is our life, and we have no other life. So if indeed we are Christ's, there's one life, it's His. We abide in Him. The Word is at the center. And so the public reading of the Word, exhortation, and the teaching. They go together, and they can even go in that order. They can even go in that order. So they're indispensable. The public reading, right? So the idea that we get together, we don't just uh, you know, talk. I remember I went to a church once where my mom was going for a little while just to check out, see, like, what's the quality of this? What is, what's going on at this church? I'm not going to name names right now. It was a denomination that, uh, you know, I, I have very serious reservations about. Um, anyway, the guy never opened the Bible who was supposed to be preaching, and he talked about Elvis, 
He told a story about Elvis for the whole time that was supposed to be, I guess you would identify it as the time where the sermon happens. And I was just like, what is this? But it's like Joel Osteen. He gets up there and he looks kind of like a preacher. You know, it looks like he's a pastor. He's going to give you the word. He's not interested in the word of God whatsoever. Zero interest in the word of God. The word is the center. So we read the word together. We read God's Word. The power is in the Word. The authority is in the Word. Through the Word, He renews your mind. He shows Himself to you. He transforms what you care about, what you like, what you want, what you love. And this tumbles downhill to your conduct, your speech, the faith in you, and the faithfulness produced by it, and the purity of your life. Not out of a proud externalism or a legalism, but the purity that comes from a sincere worship. It only will happen to the extent that the Word is at the center of the life of the church, in the center of the life of the preacher, at the center of the life of the members of the church. It is a divine Word. So it makes sense that the reading of the Word would be at the center of what we do. That's the thing we must be devoted to. It's counterintuitive to the world. How do, I, how do I build a casino with a, with, a, with, a, uh, with a word, with the word of God? How do I um, you know, uh, get a crop on my farm with a word? How do I get an airplane in the sky with the word? We've got things to do. The world's busy. Everybody's making things and doing things and got goals. Why don't we have time for this word? Well, God's goal is different. It's, it's the, like I said yesterday to the men at the breakfast, the way up is down. You start on your knees. Everything is driven by knowing God in His Word. So the reading of the Word is at the center, and it makes sense that it would be if it is the Word of God. If it is a divine, holy Word, it is authoritative. It is infallible. It can't make a mistake. It is inerrant. There aren't errors in it. It is a supernaturally authored, all-wise, all-powerful word reflecting the all-wise, all-powerful, supernatural God who says it. This word must be in the apple of your eye. This is the center of your desire, this word. And it doesn't come natural, even to a born-again person. You must cultivate this desire. You must continue in it. That's why the name of the sermon is Practice, Progress, Immerse, persist, persevere. So, in contrast, remember the false teachers in Timothy are always in the background creating a contrast between the right way. The right way that Paul is modeling and teaching to Timothy and commanding Timothy to model is always in contrast with the background here that is the false teachers. The guys who want the wrong things for the wrong reasons. These guys, remember, they've been, tra- they've been characterized multiple times now in the book. Uh, basically, they're, they're ta- caught up in myths and vain imaginations. They're, they're legalistic. They're distorting the word. They're distorting the gospel. They want attention. They want to be leaders because they want their own glory. They're not interested in making a mark for Christ. So, what is this next word here? Public reading? We're to devote ourselves to exhortation. The word for exhortation, um, it could be used sometimes um, basically for a, um, it could be used for uh, comfort. But also in this context, I think it's clearly like to, uh, you know, encourage someone or to uh, call someone strongly to, to, to action. So we don't just read the word, we exhort people, we call them. Right? That's, that's essential to preaching, a difference between mere teaching. I'm calling you to something. I'm urging you, exhorting you. God is commanding you to make this word the center of your reality and to act out of it, to live out of it, to be changed by it and to live by it. Be immersed in it and live by it. I'll tell you, this is important to get right because a lot of of times we encounter people who distort the, this concept of encouragement. Because you can think of exhort in terms of encourage, right? People distort 
the word encourage massively, massively today. And what they mean by it, they'll say things that sound good. It sounds so good. It sounds like what we should all agree to. They'll say, we need more encouragement. The church needs to be encouraged. Is that true? Does the church need encouragement? That's true. The church needs to be encouraged. Does the church need a lot of encouragement? We need tons of encouragement. So if someone says to you, oh, brother, sister, we just need to be encouraged. We need encouragement. It's true. But as is almost always the case, you have to press a little harder. How are we going to define it? What are you saying? What do you mean? And you say, we just need encouragement. Like, we merely need encouragement? Well, what do you mean by encouragement? And often what people mean today when they distort terms, what they mean is, don't call out our sin. Don't ever call out our sin. Right? That's not going to encourage us. That's not going to help us. You're just going to upset us. You're going to make us feel bad. You're going to make us feel guilty. You're going to make us feel ashamed. You're going to, you're going to offend us. You're going to remind us how young you are. You're going to remind us that you just got your MBA. Don't call out our sin. Don't emphasize doctrine is another thing that's meant sometimes when people say, a lot of times when people say, we just need encouragement. What they mean is, we don't need to get into all that doctrine stuff. We need a pep talk. Bless you. Is a pep talk going to get you through when you get the call uh, tomorrow that you are fired and you're, you're not going to be able to pay your mortgage? Is a Sunday morning pep talk enough? When you're tempted to cheat on your spouse because you feel so low about whatever it is, is a Sunday morning pep talk going to lead you to worship God with that decision? When you're tempted to steal, lie, just maybe make a little omission that's going to benefit you big time, is a little Sunday morning pep talk enough when the government kicks down your door and wants your kids. No, you, you need much more than what they mean by encouragement today. You don't need to just lay off talking about sin or to avoid that doctrine stuff. You need to be exhorted. The Word! The Word! The Word! Know it! Breathe it! Drink it, sleep it, eat it, wake up in it, go to work in it. Teach your kids with it. Treat your husband with it. And that's why public reading, exhortation, and teaching. Explain it. We must understand it. This was, they knew the word was the word of God in the synagogues before Jesus came. And they always pretty much, they, well, it was, a, it was a common practice. They would teach, they would a, a, append exposition. They would open up the Word and explain it. We need to think about what is this Word saying? What is it doing? What does it mean? What does it mean for me? What does it mean tomorrow morning at work? What does it mean when my kid has just taken markers and drawn all over my freshly painted beautiful living room? What does it mean when they've jammed a peanut butter and jelly sandwich into the DVD player? What's it going to mean when someone slams into your car because they were on the phone? Do you still have that one boss when they've slammed into your nice new car because they were on the phone like a stupid kid? Will Jesus be your boss at that moment? Well, you better really know Him. And you will not know Him in any in any way that's significant, if the reading of the Word is not at the center of the church, the public life of the church, your private life, as you follow the example that we create on Sunday and in the life of the church from the leaders, if the word of the reading of the Word is not at the center of our life, my life, your life, all week long, and the exhortation to actually know, live out of it, and the labor to understand it, to teach it, to open it up, to apply it, to comprehend it, and to see God in it, then you will go nowhere. You will go nowhere. You will be anemic, and you will be t tossed about, and you will struggle, and you will fail, and you will not prosper. 
And I'm not talking about prosper like you just got a new Tesla or something. For some of you, that might not be prospering. I don't know. I'll, I'll work on my illustrations. <clears throat> nice new truck. So, verse 14. Do not neglect the gift. Verse 14. We'll speed it up a little bit. Verse 14. Do not neglect the gift. This is Paul to Timothy. Do not neglect. Another strong word, right? Don't uh, ignore. Don't take lightly. Uh, don't uh, fail to remember and exercise the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy, right? When the council of elders, the word there is not just elder underneath, it's, it's, it's a word for like a, a group. Same word used for the religious leaders, the Sanhedrin, right? The, the uh, Pharisees and Sadducees. In this case, it's a group of elders, a plurality of elders appointed by God through the church to lead the church. Do not neglect the gift you have which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. There's a few things here to unpack. There's actually a lot going on here that we can talk about. We'll try to be uh, focused. What gift? Well, the officers of the church with the delegated authority of the church that the church has from Jesus through his word are called um, to have a ceremony, right? They have a ceremony to ordain someone to an office. Who makes ultimately someone an elder or a leader or you know this ministry position? Any of the offices. Who makes someone an elder ultimately? God, right? Who makes someone a Christian ultimately? Billy Graham? God. God makes you a Christian. And so when you hear this, don't think, okay, this is where I turn my mind off because we're talking about elders or, or missionaries or something. This is where you turn your mind on. Just like Timothy was called, there might, there's a ceremony there that's public that signifies that God has called him, He has chosen him, He has gifted him and empowered him and authorized him to lead, to do his ministry role. You too, sitting in the pew, remember this is how you're going to emulate Timothy. God has called you. He has empowered you. He has authorized you to be a member of His body. He has given you the highest calling in the universe to be His restored image, to magnify Him in all you think, say, and do. Timothy is an example here. He's to remember that God gave him this gift. Timothy, don't be discouraged. There are unbelievers around. There are false uh, elders. People you've got to work with. You've got to discipline. You even might have to kick them out. There are wolves among you. There are immature Christians among you who sheep bite. Don't get discouraged, Timothy. Remember, God made you a leader in His church. You have this gift from Him. No one takes it away from you. It's God either gives it and takes it or no one. Now the church is used instrumentally, and that's what's pictured here. We have these ceremonies because it pictures this reality. When you lay hands, it's a picture of the fact that the hand of God, the mighty power of God, has done something and is doing something. It's a picture of God's choice and God's power and authority working through the church. Prophecy is just God speaking, using men and women as His mouthpiece. So God, through this ceremony, has appointed Timothy. But the gift is from God. Don't ever think the gift is, is ultimately from the elders or from the church or from, from anyone. The gift of being a leader and all that comes with it in the church is from God. And the gift of being a member in the body of Christ is from God. No one takes it away. You can lose your, your role in the church as an elder. No one takes away your salvation. But if you do lose your role in the church righteously, it's because God has ordained that you would be removed. Right? So I just want to clarify. So this word gift, it's the same word uh, for charisma. Charisma. And it's the same root as the word for grace. Charis. Now, um, 
in our entertainment culture, our heavily um, you know, consumerized culture, we distort, distort and pervert spiritual gifts. It doesn't matter um, that the canon is closed, right? I think it's very clear from the whole witness of Scripture, canon is closed. Lord is not distributing resident uh, office gifts, right? resident gifts of healing. Chance is not a, a healer in the church. Now, we pray, Lord God, heal so-and-so, heal Jen um, from that tumor, and he might do it because he's the sovereign God and he, he can do what he pleases. But no one now has the resident office or gift of a healer or, or a prophet. The apostles were the last. And with them, the canon closed. With the ceasing of the prophets as a gift, the canon was closed. In our culture, we don't realize, we distort, there's this tendency in this entertainment culture to look at gifts in a perverted way, to think of it like um, you know, entertainment. It's stimulating, it's exciting, power. Right, But what we don't realize is every gift you have that's effective for the ministry of Jesus Christ in some sense is ultimately a spiritual gift. In some sense, all of your gifts that you use and you should be seeking diligently to use all the Lord has given you to, to benefit His church and to reach the world and to magnify Him in all areas of your life. All of your gifts that are effective for the glory of God in some real ultimate sense are spiritual you're indwelt by the holy spirit and that's why when gifts are listed in scripture even the gift of administration is listed how often do you think of administration as being a holy spirit empowered gift to be effective in the life of the church when you're thinking of gifts how often is that the first one that pops in your mind administration that's right filing documents in the office at church it is loaded with power and glory. It's, it's like one step down from fireballs out of your hand or lasers from your eyes that could cut a UPS truck in half. Zzz, filing in the office, administration, a gift of the Spirit. <laughs> That's because we sensationalize. Rather than seeing God as the glorious one, we want experience, we want manifestations, we want power. Right? Whereas the Word is calling us to find our identity and our happiness in God in a way that's unshakable, that we can glorify Him in the tiny little things that the world considers boring and insignificant. And we can glorify Him and really know and believe, I have the highest calling in the world. I'm glorifying Him right now with this filing cabinet the way the President of the United States could glorify God. Because God's not impressed with anyone. He doesn't need anyone. He's not impressed with anyone. And it's all for His glory. Not our glory. We need to renew our minds. We won't do that without the reading of the Word in a, in a devoted, uh, habitual, committed way. An exhortation to, to understand it to, and, and teaching to understand it and to live it and do it. To rely on it actively. So I think the laying on of hands is a symbolic affirmation and, and the prophecy is basically an affirmation. They're saying, you know, God has appointed Timothy. You know, there's a, there's a parallel to this passage, uh, Timothy's commission. There's two of them, actually, but one of them I'll draw your attention to. 2 Timothy 1.6, and it speaks of him with the laying on of hands, um, or his calling in terms of fan the flame is the idea in 2 Timothy 1.6. Fan the flame that's there relative to your gift. Remember your gift, fan that flame. The, uh, of the gift that's in you, the gift of God's calling and gifting and empowering for you to do your role for His glory. Well, this applies, like I said, to members too. Apply it to yourself. It, uh, number one, it presupposes the idea that you could become dull as, as a true born-again Christian, a real Christian. You could become dull. A leader could become dull. You could be weary. You could be discouraged. You could be frustrated. You could be upset. You could be downhearted about your situation, the way people behave, the way the world is, the way your church is. But Paul, in 2 Timothy 1.6, just like he is here really, he's saying, remember, God did this. God is doing this. In other words, Romans 8.28, there are no ultimate accidents. You are an elder because God wanted you to be. You are a member of His body because God wanted you to be. 
You are in the situation you're in with your hurting body, your obnoxious 28-year-old MBA boss, whatever it is, you're in that moment because God wanted it. You can trust Him. You won't know this if you're not in the reading of the Word. No one's exhorting you to, to stand on it, to rest in it, to rely on it, and no one is teaching you to understand it. And you're not actively trying to learn yourself. Very, very important. So he ends uh, verses 15, 16. There are four more um, imperatives or commands to cap things off. And what you see in this last section, you know, 15 to 16, you see a pattern of two imperatives, two commands, and then a reason. And then again, two commands and a reason. Two commands, a reason. What's he saying? What is Paul saying here? The word practice. Let me read this to you. Let me read it quick. Practice these things. I said earlier, it can have the sense of meditate on, right? So that it's like a continual activity. But in the context, I think it's clear. Like actively do these things intentionally, thoughtfully, as a matter of your discipline, right? Be in the Word. Be exhorting yourself and others. Be teaching. Be, be a student. Be being taught. And immerse yourself. Practice and immerse. The word there for immerse yourself in these things, it's literally the command form of the word be. Be in these. And the way it's applied and the way we see it used in Greek in general, it clearly should be translated something like immerse yourself. And so this is for Timothy. And always keep in mind, Timothy is modeling for you. And if I'm being faithful, so am I. With my life, I am seeking by the grace of God to be immersed in this calling to know and love God for the glory of God in Christ. Everything that I am about is this Word that shows me the One I love. The One who loved me first so that I can grow in loving Him. Knowing what He's like. Knowing what He wants. Knowing who He is. Knowing what He does. Knowing what I can count on. Knowing who I am. I have an identity. I have a new one in Christ. So he says, be in these things. Be immersed. Literally, be in these things. Practice. Meditate continually. Not once in a while. Not on the weekend. Not just when you show up at the service. Not just at the men's breakfast. Before you go to work. When you're in the truck driving around at work. When you have a flat tire. When your wife is yelling at you. Probably justified. Don't do that, ladies. You ladies, when you're yelling at your husband, remember, remember, be immersed. Practice. Meditate on this Word. Be exhorted. Be exhorting. Be taught. Be teaching. Finally, if you do this, you see, he's saying his emphasis is on the product of being in the Word, being committed to this Word, is that you will have a visible progress. This word for progress is demonstrated. You could see it in a few places. If you look in Luke 2.52, it's used, Jesus progresses in wisdom. He became a man. He was truly a man and fully a man. He progressed in wisdom and favor. He learned. That's the same word. You, Christian, you, elder, you, Timothy, should be so committed and immersed that you are visibly progressing in the faith in your knowledge and love of God and the way it impacts. It washes over your choices, your situation, your life. Jesus progressed in the wisdom. Galatians 1.14, Paul uses it to describe his old life. Paul advanced or progressed in Judaism. He was zealous for it. He thought it was the way to know and love God and glorify God. And so he was committed. He was all in. He would kill you for this God. God opened his eyes and showed him it was a false religion. But the word is used there in Galatians 1.14. He was progressing. He was actively, intentionally dis disciplining himself, discipling himself in Judaism to grow, to become a faithful, good, effective, high-quality rabbi or Pharisee, a student and teacher of Judaism, a practicer, a practitioner, if you will. You see in Philippians, Paul, his opponents 
unbeknownst to them, unwittingly, uh, while he's in jail and they're trying to spitefully kind of uh, preach the gospel for different motives, the gospel is advancing because God sovereignly wanted it. In Philippians 1.12, you see, that word is used. The gospel was advancing. What does it mean the gospel is advancing? It's having the effect. It's progressing. It's having the effect on people that God ordained and wants. People are hearing it and being converted. The sheep are being gathered and they are growing. They're advancing in the faith. The faith itself is advancing through the nations, gathering sheep, and then those sheep are advancing in their knowledge of God and their holiness as a result of the Word. Read, exhorted, and taught. So finally, actually, lastly, I'll say this about that word. You can see it used negatively if you want to go look at it later, maybe. 2 Timothy 2.16, he's talking about the opponents. In 2 Timothy 3.9 and 2 Timothy 3.13, he's talking about them advancing backwards, like spiraling down, like they're going into deeper into folly. So the idea of making movement, not just being stagnant, going somewhere. Paul uh, closes out this, this very intimate, special passage in Timothy, which it has a tone and a kind of way of speaking that's different from anything else in these letters. It's like he stops when he's saying to Timothy, remember. He stops in the midst of all these things he's saying, and he's, he's telling Timothy, persist, practice, be immersed. Remember, persevere. So this is very important. We're going to end with this last bit. But uh, last but not least, he's saying to him, keep a close watch. Keep a close watch on two things. What two things? Yourself and the teaching. So elders are to guard right doctrine. And if they are guarding right doctrine faithfully, it will be transforming them in their speech and their conduct. The two are never separable. You don't separate the two. Yourself, and this goes for you, Christian in the pew. Yourself and your doctrine, they go together. And the elders are charged specifically and in a special way to guard right doctrine, to make sure we are reading this Word, teaching it, and we are true to it. We are faithfully understanding and teaching and living it. And you too have a, have a, a call on your life to pursue right doctrine, to understand the doctrine of the Word of God, the teaching of the Word faithfully, to not compromise it with error, either from yourself or from others, from the culture. So, this is the most gripping part, I would say, of the whole thing, the whole passage where Paul stops and tells Timothy to persevere, to persist. to persist. When he says, watch yourself, watch your teaching, What does he say last there that really should get your attention? I mean, it should get you asking questions. If if you just read by this and you're yawning, like thinking about whether you might put a topper on your coffee, and man, I wish we got that other creamer that I like, and you don't stop and get like gripped by a question here, I don't think you're really reading the way you should. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this. This is what I'm talking about. For by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Oh, wow. You will save, Timothy, you'll save yourself and your hearers. So I guess the Gospel message is if you watch your conduct, your speech, you're pure, you have faith, you're committed to the public reading of the Word and exhorting and teaching, God will credit you as righteous for that and you'll be saved by that effort. And you can actually save other people if you do it well. That's what Paul must mean. Right? Right, so he just told Timothy, and by uh, implication he told you too, watch yourself and watch the teaching. So that's exactly in the next verse what you're doing. If I got up here and I really taught that, you would be unfaithful to let me do it. Because he just told Timothy, and by implication you, watch the teaching. Because it's everything. In right teaching, in this Word, you know me and you love me, the true God. Don't let anyone get away with distorting this teaching. 
Don't let any wicked other gospel take the place of the real one that saves. The only gospel that saves and transforms people into real worshipers. So we must, knowing that this Word is God's Word, all of it is God's Word, even with 40-some authors, God is the ultimate author of this Word. And so an implication of that is we must synthesize all of the Word together. You don't sweep some of the Word under the carpet because it's inconvenient. You always take into consideration the whole Word has something to say about the whole rest of the Word. So you must synthesize all of these letters and books. Put them together. That's all that is, a fancy word. Put them together. Harmonize. Figure out, not, not in a way that's contrived or, or that does violence to the Bible, but how to harmonize. That means how they sing together. Like this morning, you heard me singing terribly. I was not harmonized with the worship leader. If you harmonize the word, that means two parts that seem dissonant, like, wow, that's a different key. They actually are in the same key. The problem's not the word, it's me or you. It's the interpreter. We have to look at the Word, take everything it says, and understand these things in a way that are all in the same key. They're not contradicting each other. God is not saying you're saved by grace through faith alone. And by the way, if you do a good job at all this, that's how you're going to be saved. And you'll help Karen and Jen and Danny be saved too. You'll be saved by a good, strong effort. That is not at all what's meant if we synthesize and harmonize and we take the whole Word together as one Word from God through 40 human authors plus, right? So what is meant, Chris? Well, two things, right? This is the capstone of this message because the whole point is this, that God, the way God saves us, He saves us to be glorified in us growing as God lovers. So it's not just, hey, you're saved, it's all good, you go about your business, do whatever you want. It's, I have caused you to be born again. I've made you mine so that you now will go on a journey, on a mission, and you must persevere. You must continue. You must be immersed. You must practice. You must concentrate. You must meditate. You must labor to know me and love me. And through this grace, I will be working in your heart and I will keep you. You will not fall away. You will not be succumb to errors like these false teachers. I am glorified, God is communicating. I am glorified by your life as it is being transformed by this grace. This grace doesn't just get you out of hell. It gets you me. This grace gets you God back. This grace gets you the God who you were made to adore. And so, perseverance is the relational process of actively, continually, as a matter of discipline and habit, looking to Him, understanding His Word, Trusting His Word. Applying His Word. Exhorting one another in His Word. So He's saying instrumentally, right? It's not this is how you'll be safe. It actually is the word saved. There's a different word. To be safe from heresy or something is a different word. He's actually using the word here to be saved. Like ultimate salvation. But He's not saying that you're saved by works. He's saying that it's instrumental. Like Paul. Do you remember when Paul was in a shipwreck? What did Paul say? The, word, the Lord gave Paul a word. And what did he say to the people on the ship when they were in a storm? Yeah, well, he, he said a very comforting thing. Paul said, everyone, the Lord has spoken to me. Everyone is going to live. No one will perish. And then Paul also said, if you leave this ship, you, I'm paraphrasing, will surely die. What? <laughs> no one will die, I guarantee it. If you get off this ship, you're going to die. Promised. No doubt. Take it to the bank. Cash it. What's that? That's the reality here, right? So you, as a Christian, if you're his, if you've been born again, you will never be lost. He's keeping you. You're His. You're sealed. You have the Spirit. You've been born again. He doesn't lose anyone. He is a perfect Savior. A perfect High Priest. And no one who He came to get and applies His blood to falls away or slips through the cracks or gets forgotten. He will meet your need and keep you and I guarantee it. Because He says so. I know it from His Word. 
However, if you get off this ship, you just go and wander off. You don't put the Word at the center of the, your life. We're not, the public reading of the Word is not our priority. The reading of the Word is not your priority. Exhortation to actually rely on it and believe it, that's not my priority. Is it your priority? No, we don't care about that. Teach it. Read it. Understand it. Diligently try to know God in the Word. If that's not your priority, and all this stuff is at best merely ritual or cultural, or you just bail out on church altogether. I want to go, you know, maybe I'll deal drugs now. Whatever it is. Or maybe I'll just go be a businessman who has no regard for God. I just do whatever I want. It could look a lot of ways. You will surely die. It's the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. Everyone who belongs to Him will be saved without fail. But He saves us instrumentally. He matures you and He keeps you, and He makes you a monument to His grace as your life is meant to produce and yield countless beautiful fruits that communicate to the world what He's worth. Amen? Amen. Thank You so much, Lord God, for Your glorious Word that we can hear it. Lord, yes, You can make these dry bones live. You're the one who saved us. You're the one who keeps us. You're the one who drives us to look to You, to, to love Your Word, to trust You, to teach Your Word, to understand Your Word. We want You. You are our salvation and You are our blessing, Lord. Please help us to not deceive ourselves and be a people who take lightly this calling. This is an all-encompassing and all-consuming calling, Lord. Help Your people to be sober to it. We rest in You and from that rest, we have strength to go to battle, to go into our life, to go and produce these fruits because of your mercy and your love and your goodness, your grace. We're not saved by anything we do. But Lord, you've saved us for your own name. Send your people out as missionaries today. Let us glorify you as we persevere, as we immerse ourselves in your word. And let us know you and love you better every day. Thank you heroic Savior. In your beautiful name we pray, Jesus. Amen.